the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Middle of the ocean. Now let's see how this works. According to Vichy Michal Tokashivsky, if this is Monday, Monday stops here, you go over this line, and now it's Tuesday. And then that just continues this way. According to Chazanish, this is Tuesday. Tuesday stops here, you cross the line, and now it's Monday, which continues. Which means in this area, according to Vichy Michal Tokashivsky, it's one day earlier, sorry, one day later than it is. According to Chazanish, according to Chiyum Echel Tokashinsky, this is Tuesday. According to Chazanish, this is Monday. What falls in this area? Most of Alaska, as we mentioned. Eastern Siberia, Japan, Hawaii. And this is very relevant for people who travel to Hawaii. Some people travel to Japan too, but for Hawaii, most of Australia, maybe three quarters of Australia, which is to the east of the Chazanish's line, and all of New Zealand, all these six areas fall within this, 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 this range of doubt here, which means that there should some disagreement, some machlokes about what day they should be observing. Now they all observe basically different days based on their political orientation. But the question is whether that's the right day or the wrong day. These all, Siberia, Japan, and Australia and New Zealand all observe the same day as Asia and China, which means that if it's a Tuesday on the calendar here, it's Tuesday on the calendar here, just the sun rises earlier here. Same in Japan, same in Australia, same in New Zealand. Hawaii and Alaska being part of America, they observe the day of America. Meaning if it's Monday here, it's Monday there, just a little later than it happens here because the sun rises later. Same thing in Hawaii. According to, this gets difficult, but uh, but it's this is how it is. According to the Chazanish, all these areas, Siberia, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, are all observing the correct day, which means that when it's Saturday here, it's Shabbos. When it's Sunday, it's the day after Shabbos. These are all, excuse me. See, I get mixed up too, pardon me. According to the Chazanish, they're all, they're all doing the wrong day. They say it's Tuesday, because it's Tuesday here, but really it should be halachically Monday, because really it's a day earlier, because this is the Chazanish's line, which means that according to Chazanish, when it says Saturday here, and here, and here, and here, it's really Erev Shabbos. And when is Shabbos? On Sunday, according to Chazanish. According to Chiyam Echel Tukashinsky, they're all doing the right thing. And the opposite is true over here. According to the Chazanish, they're all doing the correct day. When they say it's it's Saturday, it's Shabbos. But according to Rechim Michal Tukashinsky, these guys are over the line, which means when they say it's Saturday, it's really halachically Sunday. And Shabbos should really what they call Friday, because here's Friday, here it should be Saturday, according to Allah. Friday should be Shabbos. So that means according to Rechim Michal Tukashinsky, they're doing the wrong day. And Friday in, in, in Alaska and Hawaii is Shabbos, and Saturday is the day after Shabbos. Okay, now let's move forward. Let's move forward. Despite the fact, despite the fact that there were communities in Australia and in Japan, Australia had a community 100 years before the World War II. Japan had a community maybe dating back to 1910. There was also a small community in Harbin, Eastern China, which was dating back to 1890s, 1880s. He had refugees from the pogroms in Europe. They had a chash of a rub. His name was Rav Kisilov. He advised the, the new settlers in Japan, the Yiddish settlers in the 1910s, what day to keep. And Australia's going on for 100 years. <clears throat> no Australian rub, we don't have a single chuva, single responsum that ever discussed what day they should observe in Australia. They never discussed it. Rabbi Salah Stern, who wrote the chuvas, Betzel HaChachma, wrote many chuvas, many response about what happens when you go from Australia to America, to San Francisco, over here, to Japan, but not a single line was devoted to which day Australia should observe. It was taken as, as, as a fact that didn't even require any discussion that they should observe the same day as China, and basically that this is not the line. That's, that's what Australia, no one bothered them, no one discussed them, they were left alone, even the Australian Rabbanim didn't deserve it worthy of discussion. Until the war, and the refugees arrived from Europe in Japan and in Kobe. And at that point in time, the, um, the, they had a problem. They didn't know which day to keep. 
they went to the Briskarov. The Briskarov told them that Rav Yitzchak, the inspector, um, decades before, had refused to answer the question, saying that he wasn't um, uh, knowledgeable enough in these areas to give an answer to the question. So, and, um, and, and they had a question, and what to do about Shabbos. Should they keep Shabbos like the Chazanish, which means that their Saturday should be Erev Shabbos, their Sunday should be Shabbos, or could they keep Shabbos like Rav Chiyu Mechotun which means it's their Saturday is Shabbos and their Sunday is the day after Shabbos. The Mir Yeshiva, for example, followed the opinion of Reb, of, of Reb Chaim Chuchiner, who was Reb Chaim Shmulevitz, that they went ahead and kept the local day. They kept Shabbos on Saturday and Sunday was Mosei Shabbos. There were some members of the Yeshiva who, who Bitsina in private went ahead and did the other thing, did the opposite, or, or didn't do Malacha on uh, Sunday. They didn't dare walk into the yeshiva on Sunday and Shabbos closed. They kept their distance. But um, that was the Mir Yeshiva until the end of its tenure, right before they ended, Rev, um, Rev, um, Rev Finkel, Rev Yudah Finkel sent a telegram that they should keep the Chazanish. But that was maybe two weeks before they all left. But for most of the time there, the yeshiva officially filed the opinion of Chaim Shmulevitz, they did that. But different refugees did different things. It was well known, the Amshanover, is rumored to have in private kept two day Shabbos, but all this was doable until finally the Yom Kippur came. And Yom Kippur was on the horizon, October 1st, 1941. Yom Kippur was scheduled for when that Wednesday, which according to Rav Chiyu Mechel Tukashinsky was exactly the correct day for Yom Kippur. The, the day that they're observing is in fact the day of Asia, and they were all prepared to fast on Wednesday. However, those who um, either held by or were concerned from the opinion of the Chazanish realized that for them, the correct day for Yom Kippur would be Thursday, because that's really, even though the calendar says it's a day after Yom Kippur, but for them, halachically, which advanced calendar is a day ahead of itself, and really, it's, it really it's on the American side, and really Yom Kippur should be observed on Thursday. It's one thing to keep Shabbos for 50 hours, as I mentioned, it's doable, and I'm here as testimony that you can survive, but Yom Kippur for two days, for all the daf learners, Rabbi Agatstein, Zeshir, and everyone else, um, we know the Gemara considers that to be pikuach nefesh, Tam Arya and everything else, that's a, it's a bloody path to go ahead and keep two days Yom Kippur, it's something that the people in Bavel, despite the fact that they kept two days Yontiv, many of them, but when it came to Yom Kippur, it was only one day they based themselves on a presumption rather than go ahead and keep two days Yom Kippur. Two days Yom Kippur is not something people can do. So the issue really came to a head here about what to do about Yom Kippur. The Chazanish sent a telegram to the refugees that you should go ahead and fast on Thursday and eat on Wednesday. Rav Herzog convened the based in. He tried to get everyone there, but there were many no-shows. Many people didn't come, many people did, many didn't. Chazanish notably wasn't there, the Briskarov wasn't there. Rebengus wasn't there. Other of the gedolim of that of that day were not there. He sent a telegram to the refugees. <laughs> Excuse me. Fast on Wednesday, like the calendar says, and don't you dare risk any danger by fasting on also Thursday. After this telegram came to the refugees, Chazanish sent another telegram telling them they should eat on Wednesday and fast on Thursday, and everything will be good. So the refugees had in their hands two conflicting telegrams on what they should do. Now, I devote some space in my safer. It's not our topic now about what is a yid supposed to do in such a situation. If you're a Talmud of the Chazanish, then you're entitled to do everything like the Chazanish. In theory, if you're a Talmud of Rav Herzog or one of the people on the base then you can do everything like them. But if you're neither a Talmud, neither of the Chazanish or that, and you don't have any particular rub of the disputants who you follow, so then you're really in a pickle over here, what you should be doing, because you have no way of resolving this conflict. And you have two conflicting sucking. It, it, it was a serious issue for the refugees. The Mir Yeshiva was gone already. They weren't part, part, um, part of this uh, issue, but there still were refugees there. And it was a problem for them what they did. Some fasted one of the two days. Some of them uh, um, did Shiurim, let's say, on the Chazanish's day on Thursday. But it was, it was an issue for them. And, um, and that was unresolved for them. Now, on Rav Herzog's based in, besides Rav Tukachinshi on the right, there was also Rav Yisr Zalman Meltzer, Rav Svi Pesach Frank. 
And they didn't all share the same opinion. They came to the same result, but they didn't all share the same opinion, excuse me. <clears throat> the Tukashinsky's opinion we already mentioned had to do with that he held it made sense for there to be the same amount of degrees east of Yerushalayim as west of Yerushalayim. That was his opinion. With this was Alan Meltzer, and C.S. Meza Frank held a different opinion. They came to the same result, but a different opinion based on the opinion of the Radvaz. The Radvaz and Chelek Aleph, Simon Ayin Vav, says, he comments on the halacha, that when a person gets lost in the desert, it's brought at the end of Yilcha Shabbos, Simon Shin Dalad Mem, Simon Shin Dalad Mem in Shulchan Arach, when a person gets lost in the desert and he realizes that he forgot what day Shabbos is, is talking in the days before GPS, before devices, if anyone can imagine such things, or you can just imagine that your battery ran out, which is possible, and there's no, uh, no UBS support to go ahead and recharge it. Whatever it is, the person is completely separated from society, and he doesn't know what day it is. The halacha is that when that happens, when you realize it's happened, you make for yourself a contrived count of the days. You declare, okay, today's the first day I don't remember, today's Sunday. The next day's Monday, you count six days, and you make the seventh day Shabbos. You daven tefillah Shabbos, you go out and make Kiddush, you have Suda Shabbos, and there are other laws about what kind of malach you can do during the week and what kind of malach you do on that Shabbos. But the Radvaz makes the point that that day you observe of Shabbos, even though the likelihood that it's really Shabbos is small, like it's a one in seven chance, because probably it's not really Shabbos, but nevertheless, the fact that you're counting six days and keeping the seventh day of Shabbos is fully invested with all the import of Shabbos. It counts just like a real Shabbos. That's the Rav saying. It's not that you're just doing something ceremonial. For you, it's really Shabbos. And based on that, Rav Yisrael Zalman Meltzer and Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank, they went ahead and said that the same thing's over here. Sorry about that. Let's go back. Same thing's over here. That since you don't know when Shabbos should be in that 90 degrees of the world, one quarter of the world. So when, when, whenever it was settled and the people came and settled it and they kept their day with them, they didn't know anything about a date line. Just if you, if you traveled from Asia, so then you just figured the sun is, is rising a little earlier, but you didn't make it a different day. And since that was the six days and the seventh day of Shabbos, what the Kuzari says in the, in, in Perak Bays, in Perak Bays, um, Oschaf, the, the Kuzari says that when they when civilization moved from Yerushalayim and it spread across Asia and Africa and Europe, they took their day with them. And that's why you never find anyone having a different day of the week in all of the European, Asian, African landmass. It's the same thing happened in Japan, they said. They went there, they declared it to be Shabbos because it was their seventh day. They didn't know about Shabbos, but it was their seventh day. And therefore, that's the day of Shabbos. Depends on where it got settled from. So we see here, it's very easy to see that if we're talking about going from Asia and populating Japan, not so visible on this map, but populating Japan over here. So it's most likely, if we had to guess, that Japan got settled from Asia. And therefore, the day that they're observing, which is the Asian day, is exactly the correct day. And that was their PSAC. Now, there are many questions on that PSAC. Um, one of them you see right in front of your eyes, which is that if, if we go by the day of settlement, then what about North America? What about all us folks? I mean, I don't live in Los Angeles anymore. But what about everyone in Los Angeles? Everyone is participating in today's year. What's the day of the week for people in North America? If the initial settlement is what determined, if we had to guess, we don't have any history. If we had to guess where North America was settled from, it's 85 kilometers across the Bering Strait from, from Europe. It's many hundreds of kilometers, many, many stops across from, from islands, from the UK, eventually to Iceland, to Greenland. And Greenland isn't green, gentlemen, and Iceland isn't ice. It's the other way around. It both use Lush and Sagi Nahar. Um, this is completely in hospital. They have to go all the way up here, back down here. If we had to guess, probably North America was settled from Asia. That would, that would be where I would put my money. And if we settled for Asia and their, their premise is correct, that would mean everyone here is really keeping the wrong day. That what we call Saturday is really Friday. 
who we call Sunday is really Shabbos, but we all got it wrong. You can't say that. You just can't say that. Um, even Rav if it's true. Rav, Rav Mordechai? Yes. yes. Yeah. The original Indians, etc. the original Native Americans who came across into North America and then South America came across the Siberian bridge there. But they, you can't, they, we don't even know if they had dates and everything like that. America was settled by Europe, by Spain, and eventually by England. And they brought their day and that day was accepted. And it means, yes, and the same thing when you say they were settled Japan, that means how far back do you go? Do you go back right. to the indigenous people? Or since so, America so, was settled, maybe we do follow the days so, that came from Europe. So, yes, so Rabbi Agatstein, this is all correct. There are many open questions here. Is it, is it from initial settlement? Is it from the Yidin who kept Shabbos? And how many makes, how many makes a decision? One, 10 men, women, children, and how far, once they settle an area, how far is the area? That's the extent of their encampment. It goes maybe to Tchum Shabbos, to Rabbanan, 2,000 mil, 12, 2,000 Amis, 12 mil. How far do you take it? There are many, many unanswered questions. One thing's for sure, though. The Kuzari discusses the, the progression of settlement, and he's clearly not discussing Yiddish settlement. He's discussing just a natural progression of the world settlement. And as far as the Kuzari is concerned, that's what carries the day, pardon the pun, that's what carries the day throughout Asia, throughout Europe, and that's why they're all keeping the same day. And the Kuzari gives that validity. So one of the, the, one of the problems here with this, with this approach is that there's so many unanswered questions, it's very difficult to say that the Rebona Shalom made Shabbos dependent on something where we have more questions and answers and things that we can't answer. To say the Rebona Shalom made Shabbos with a, with a big question mark is a difficult thing to say that that was a resolution of Shabbos. But besides for all of that, there's another question. If, if we just, um, if we just if there's another question. And that is, is that the Radvaz was discussing Shabbos, specifically the Allah of Shabbos. Now, you don't know what day Shabbos is. You keep six days and the seventh day is Shabbos. And that has really no bearing on the day of the month. The day of the month is not connected to day of the week. Our calendars, everything works works easily because we know what day of the month it is. We know what day of the week it is. But if, if a person gets lost in the, in the desert, he has a way of figuring out when Shabbos is for him. But he has no way of figuring out what Yontav is, the Bir Alacha, and Simon Shindal and Mem says that a person, if he doesn't know when Yontav is, just has to look at the moon and just decide his way through and figure it out. When he sees it's a full moon, so then he knows it's not Yom Kippur. When he sees the moon is, is, is definitely not full anymore, he knows it's not Sukkot and Pesach. But he's got to do his best guess. <laughs> but we don't have any formula for, for giving any validity to the day of the month. So here we were talking about not only what to do about Shamis, which was important, but also what to do about Yom Kippur. And how they derive that from, from there is really a big question mark. I've heard some people say, the Rebister Zalman, they, they wrote their opinions in Hakdama to a certain safer. I've heard some people say that their Hakdamas were forged and, and fabricated. Hard for me to believe that. But, but whatever it is, the opinion doesn't basically help at all for the day of the month which is not under discussion in the, in, the, in the Radvaz or in the Shulchan Aruch and Simon Shindal and Mem. And the day of the month is what we need here and it doesn't help. So we're going to put that opinion aside and then focus just on the opinions of Rav Tukhichinsky and the Chazanich. Now, before we do that, we need to know a little bit about the Molad. I'm sure Rabbi Agustin and your Shurim here, you, you've explained perfectly to everyone how the Molad works and what it is. So for any who attended Rabbi Agustin Shir, this is all old hat. And you know it like like nothing. But for those who haven't, and maybe for those who um, who didn't get it the first time, or maybe even forgot because it was a number of days ago, not too many, but it was. So let's just do a, a, a fairly brief review here, because without understanding the molid, we really can't understand the derivation of the the, the Chazanisha's date line with the Balamor and the and the Kuzri. So here we go. What we see in front of our eyes are two paths: the yellow path. Not surprisingly, is the path of the sun in our sky. We know the Earth orbits around the sun. That's not what we're showing here. We're showing the sun takes a certain path in our sky, a daily path. It runs on a certain line. That line moves somewhat over the year, the course of the year. That's not the discussion here. Just the sun has a path in the sky. The moon, which is the gray line here, 
does not keep exactly the same path as the sun as it orbits around the earth in one month. In the course of the orbit, there's a point where it is five degrees below the path of the sun and also five degrees above the path of the sun. What that means is, is that over here it's five degrees to the south and over here it's five degrees to the north. At two points within its orbit is exactly on the same line <coughs> Excuse me. It's exactly on the same line in our sky as the sun. Now, this difference here to the north to the south, by the way, this really explains beautifully what, what they used to ask the Aden, which way the crescent is facing. Is it facing to the north? Is it facing to the south? It happens not to be what the Gemara says. And I'm not sure why the why, or at least not how the not what the Gemara says. I'm not really sure why this wasn't mentioned, but it's going. This doesn't happen at the same time each month, even though it's an orbit of the moon. It doesn't happen at the same time each month. I could explain to you why. Probably Rabbi Agassiz already did, because really the orbit of the moon is not 29 and a half days. It's only 27 and third days. So therefore, it comes out that this changes within what we call a chodesh, it's not always at the same time. Now, at the molid, at the molid, the moon is either north or south of the sun usually. If it happens to be that the molid falls out when the moon's path is crossing the sun's path in the sky, you have a solar eclipse because the moon is in front of the, um, of the sun, the sun is in back of the moon, all the sun's light then is blocked by the moon. But ordinarily, the moon is gonna to be to the north or the south of the sun when the mullet occurs. And therefore you won't be able to see the moon because you can't, you can't see the reflection of the sun. But, but nevertheless, it's not gonna block the sun's light. Let's see this a little further. This is a picture. Um, I won't tell you where I got this picture, but um, it's, it's from the Arabs. But uh, this is a picture of how the moon and the sun are, are oriented in the sky right before the mullet, right before the mullet. The moon is to the west of the sun in the sky. Now, when can you see this moon? You cannot see it, and this explains why Rashi always says what he says. You cannot see it at sunset because you've got the big bright sun in back of the moon, and it's too close for you to be able to see the moon. And first the moon sets, and then the sun sets. So at sunset, you will not see the old moon. But going around to sunrise in the east, the moon rises before the sun. So the sun's still below the horizon. The moon is here. And if the moon is far enough away from the sun, you can see the old sun, the old moon. So you can always see the old moon before the molad, only at sunrise, before sunrise, but not at sunset. Okay, now, what happens is, as the molad approaches, the moon moves further and further to the east, to the east. And eventually it gets to the point of the sun. If it's right here, it's going to be a solar eclipse. If it's to the north or to the south, which it usually is, that's what we call the molot. The astronomical term is conjunction. That's what we call the molot. When it's on the same line in the sky, the same space in the east-west line, that's the molot. But it's not an eclipse. It's to the north. Or to the south, usually. Now, the moon continues moving to the east. And eventually, at the time of the moon, new moon, the moon is now east of the sun, and it's separated far enough from the sun that you're able to see it. How far does it have to travel to be able to, for it to be separate enough that the moon's reflection on the, the sun's reflection on the edge of the moon is going to be noticeable enough that you can see it? Again, if we look here, we see that at sunset is when we can see the new moon because the brightness of the sun will descend below the horizon. We'll still have the moon trailing it from the east above the horizon. That's when we'll see the new moon. At sunrise though, the sun rises first. And then when the moon comes up, we'll never see it. It's much too small, much too close to the sun to see. So that's why there's a difference between when you can see the old moon, where you can see the new moon. But back to our discussion here, how far away does it have to travel before it's far enough away that you can see it. According to Rashi on the Daf and Tosfis, six hours. Six hours after it was over here, 
It's far enough away that you can see the crescent. According to the Balamor and the Kuzari, it has to be 24 hours away. Until 24 hours, you can't see it. According to the Yisod Olam, who was a disciple of the Rush, it's 22 and a half hours. According to the Rivad, it's 18 hours. There is no consent amongst Rishonim how far this has to be away before you can see it. But the shot we're going in now, Rashi held six hours. <coughs> which is why he did not explain the Gemara like the Balamor and the Kuzu. He couldn't. Anyone who doesn't hold 24 hours can. So the Balamor and the Kuzuri's presentation is predicated on their shita that it takes 24 hours. It's what we call in Yeshiva a machlokis and mitzias, a disagreement in, in physical characteristics and not in an opinion. But nevertheless, they have this wide-ranging disagreement. And now we're going to see how it works according to the Balamor and the Kuzari, that it takes 24 hours for the moon to travel until there's enough reflection of the sun that's visible on the earth that we can go ahead and see the new crescent. Here's the, these are the opinions we're discussing. Yes, now here's the Gemara. It was Daf Chaf. Today was Daf Lamed in Los Angeles still. So that's only 10 days ago, which means, um, which means however well we remember it. But whatever the case is, there are two statements in the Gemara Daf Chaf Hamid Beis. Reb Zeira says that if you make a day, we want to make a day Rosh Chodesh, you can only make that day Rosh Chodesh if the Laila and the Yom are from the Chodesh, meaning if the night and the day completely are after the Molot. That's Reb Zeira. And then Rabbi, uh, uh, Abba Vud Reb Zimloi says another thing, if you want to see the new moon on the same day as the Molot, it has to happen before Chatzos. If it happens after midday, you cannot be certain that the new moon is going to be visible before sunset. Two statements. Again, you want a day to be Rosh Chodesh? The night and the day have to, by the way, this is the hard part of the shear, okay? I don't know whether you did the Balamor and the, the Kuzri when you, when you said the shear. I presume not, but any rate, but here it goes. Again, you want a day to be Rosh Chodesh? The Balamor and the Kuzri, excuse me, the night and the day and the night have to be after the molad. You want to see the moon on that same day as the molad? It has to happen before noon. Okay. Now let's see how the Balamor and the Kuzari explain this gemara. This is the Kuzari. Here's a Hebrew un, unredacted, and here's an English translation. And let's see the emphasis here. What does it mean? The molad happens before midday. It means in Yerushalayim. That's where it's important. When we say when the molad is. It means Yishalayim. By the way, not all Rishonim agree with this, but this is the opinion of the Balamor and the Kuzari. So Molot occurs before noon in Yishalayim. Where can you see the new moon? Where can that be? You see it to someone who's at the eastern edge of China. What does it mean that the day has to be the night and the day after the Molot? That means in China, okay? The, just, just to show you it's the same thing, the um, this is the Balamor, he says the same thing. Yerushalayim, where are we? Yerushalayim, that's where the bullet appears. Who can see it? The people at the edge to the east. And where is the night and the day have to be after the Molin? Again, at the edge of the east. Both, both hold the same opinion. And just to visualize that, I'm going to bother you a little graphically to go back up to our full world map. Um, just uh, pardon me here, I should have put it here. Well, let's just see this graphically how it works, okay? So just bear with me a little bit. Okay, here we are. Now, here's Yerushalayim, okay? The molot is at noon in Yerushalayim. The molot is at noon in Yerushalayim. So until sunset in Yerushalayim, we're talking about an equinox day, which means it's a good 12-hour daytime. It's six hours until sunset, all right? Six hours from noon until sunset, which means sunset Yerushalayim is six hours after the noon mola. This is the easy part, okay? Now, we need another 18 hours, according to the Kuzri and the Balamor, until we can see the new moon. We need another 18 hours. Where's my mouse come back? Another 18 hours. <coughs> Where are we gonna get those 18 hours? We're gonna watch the sunset spread from Yerushalayim Let's go over here. I can't see your slime so well. Let me see it. Spread from your shalayim and start moving west. That's what sunset does, right? First in shalayim, then in Cyprus, then in Italy, then in Spain, then to America, 
sunset moving along 18 hours, going, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> ending up right here. This is really the Chazanish's calculation. And this is where then, at this point, is where 24 hours later, six hours in Yerushalayim, and then another 18 hours for sunset to, to move along in the course of his travels, 24 hours later, right here, almost at the Eastern coast of Asia, we're missing here three degrees, which is a little bit of an issue, but let's imagine that away for now. 24 hours later, right here in this spot, is where you can first see the new crescent. The molid was before noon. I can see the crescent here. And also over here, when it was molid, when noon in Yerushalayim, it was sunset here. 24 hours elapsed at this place, meaning the whole night and the whole day take place after the molid, and it's still the same day. So that teaches us that the day extends from Yerushalayim all the way to the west, excuse me, for 18 hours. And it also teaches us that the day stops right here. Why? How do we know the day doesn't further continue inland? Because if it further continued inland, then the molid would not be limited by noon. Let's say it continued another hour inland, then the molid could even be at one o'clock in Yerushalayim. Because 24 hours after that it would be sunset here. And, and so the fact that sunset, that the molid is limited by noon in Yerushalayim, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. <coughs> the fact that molid is limited by 24 hours in Yerushalayim tells us that the limit of the day is right here. That's the derivation. It tells us it extends from Yerushalayim all the way to here, and it stops right here. And that's what the Chazanish says, that the Bal Balamor and the Kuzari derive the date line from that Gemara. And then the Chazanish says that if you're deriving a date line from a Gemara, so then the fact that the, the Rechil Michal said this is not symmetrical carries no weight, because the Gemara and the Rishonim would carry all the weight, and nice ideas and concepts about how you think things evenly divide is completely irrelevant if the Gemara says otherwise. Basically, the Balamor and Akuzari refute the opinion of Rivchim Melchot Tukashinsky. That's what we see here, okay? I hope this was understandable. This is the hard part, but um, that's the idea. Again, just one more summary before we do it. You see from the Gemara, as explained by the Balamor and Akuzari, that you need 24 hours after sunset to get to the to get to the end of the line. That's from noon to sunset in your slime is six hours. Another 18 hours brings us all the way to this point. You can't go beyond this point because the Gemara tells us that noon is the limit, which means that this is the limit. Why not later? Because obviously this is already the next day and it has to be on the same day. So this is the limit. This is how we see it, all right? So now, moving then, pardon this skipping through here. Okay, so now, the Chazanish somewhat refines his opinion. And this is important here, and let's just see this. He refines his opinion that his line, this 90 degree line that we saw, when it crosses the landmass, it doesn't actually separate the day. The reason for that is based on something the Yisodol and the Russia's disciples said. It doesn't make sense, he says, to have two neighbors, one sitting on one side of a table, one sitting on the second side of the table, and this guy is eating a Shabbos Suda, and this guy's having Malava Malka. It, it's, you, can't, you can't have such a thing, which really means that you can't put Shabbos, it can't be devotional made Shabbos dependent on lines that nobody can figure out where they are. If it's the coastline, everyone knows where it is. If it's the middle of a landmass, then even with today's advanced um, tools, you still don't know exactly where the line is. It's not painted in red on the ground. And you don't even know where to start from because you're not sure where in your shalim to start from. Where should you start from? Do you start from uh, 
Ben Yehud and Yafo? Probably not, yeah. She start from the from Shar Yafo, start from the, the base of Migdish, where Mibena Kruvim, like where are you supposed to start? We don't know. So you're never going to get it exact. So to say that, that that is what Shabbos depends on is difficult. Rather, Chazanish says, it goes all the way to the coast. Mind you, that's what the Kuzari said. The Kuzari said that. And the Chazanish says that regarding one little island here in the Philippines, which most of you should not be visiting because that's where the gorillas roam. And I don't mean the kind they put in the zoo. And, um, and also, the same thing for Australia. Even though we have three quarters of Australia on the other side of the Chazanish's line, he says, since some of it is on this line, it all goes. Let's see that in the next slide. Because Australia is really much different than Siberia. Australia, unlike Siberia, let's see Siberia again. Siberia is a nice big chunk of land here on, on, on the east side of the, of the Chazanish's date line. But nevertheless, it's still the minority of land compared to all of Asia and Africa and Europe, which are all attached. It's just a minority. It makes sense to say the minority gets schlepped after the majority. But Australia is completely different. Australia's absolute on three quarters of the landmass of Australia is on the day before sign of the Chazanish's line. And nevertheless, he says it has the same status as Western Australia. And not only that, Chazanish says the reason why that should be, even though Lachara, it seems that the logic would indicate differently, is because, is because this is the Eretz Yisrael site. And the Eretz Yisrael site is the main site, all right? But the, the difference between this and Siberia is, is that Siberia, at least Siberia is connected to Eretz Yisrael. And when it comes to Australia, it's not connected to Eretz Yisrael. So the Chazanish really here is saying two novelties, two chidushim. One is that we say this, this concept, even the majority after the minority. And the second is we say it even when it's not connected to Eretz Yisrael. Chazanish is entitled. But usually for something as severe as Shabbos, we would say, that if you're going to say something about Shabbos, you need a Raya or a Makor. And really, there's no Raya, there's no proof or source for saying that. Chazanish can say it. But to say, I always tell the Australians, you're going to be a lot better off. By the way, here's Melbourne, here's Sydney, here's Brisbane. You're going to be a lot better off if that Lach is like Rechim Michal Tukashinsky, because then you're, you're, you're safe. But if Allah is like the Chazanish, you need to rely on these two Chidushim to explain why you're keeping Shabbos on Saturday and not on Sunday. And, um, but, but whatever the result is, that's when they keep Shabbos, all right? Rev um, Sternbuch said that presciently, even though they didn't realize it, they locked themselves into the opinion of Chazanish, but really practically what happened was they were relying on the opinion of Rechil Mechel Tukashinsky and the dateline was in the mid-Pacific. Now let's get to the end of this year. Here's again our world map with our, with our spaces in the middle, our six locations. Let's see what the contemporary post can do. Now really it's a surprise ending. Because if we had to guess, we would say that Rav Tukashinsky's line was really a line based on just feeling and svara. And the Chazanisha's line is based at least on the opinion of the Balamor and the Kuzari, which refute this line. So even if you have some kashas on this line, that three degrees over here is one question, which the Chazanish resolves, say it used to be the land went here. And there are other questions, like most who showed them don't seem to say that. And other, other issues, if we go deep, more deeply into the Balamor, which we're not doing this evening. But nevertheless, this Ribtukashinsky line seemed to have been like thrown out the window by the Balamor and the Kuzari, as we just saw. They didn't hold, you needed something symmetrical. So let's see how, how the halacha resolves itself. So Alaska, really, we don't have, when I say contemporary postkin, which I'm going to display now, I mean Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Vosner, Rav, um, Rav Gustman. Rev Scheinberg, Rev Nassim Gestetner, Rev Yashiv, um, those post him, but basically they don't all say exactly the same thing, but basically this is a consensus. Alaska, I don't have an answer to what they hold. Um, when Rev Bess went around to, to the Gedolim and asked them for their opinions about the dateline, Alaska was not on his list of questions. I don't know why, but um, uh, Rev Gershon Schlitter told me that he didn't ask them about Alaska, so we don't have that information. What we do know is the Chazanish volunteered. Now, Chazanish, this is no question, because this is on his Monday side of the line. So they should keep the day in America. But he volunteered for Tukachinsky, who had trouble with this. He said, listen, let me help you out, okay? You see this? This is called North America, the South America. This is little Alaska over here. The minority goes after the majority. Don't worry about this line here. Just, it has all the same thing. 
Tukashinsky wasn't so certain, but the Chazanish was volunteering for Tukashinsky what day it should be. But practically, we don't have a lot of, of existing psak about what to do about Alaska from the post of the previous generation. Siberia, everyone agrees they're keeping the right day. Saturday is Shabbos. Of course, it's on the landmass, of course, everything. That's no debate. Japan is what I write here Monday and Tuesday, which means the Ikra Alocha for davening is like Rav Tukashinsky, which means what they're calling Wednesday is Wednesday, what they're calling Saturday is Shabbos, what they're calling Sunday is the day after Shabbos. When it comes to Malacha, it's the Raisa, then out of deference to the other opinion, the opinion of the Chazanish, based on the Balamor and Akuzari, you should also keep Sunday for Malachas on Shabbos. This just means Monday and Tuesday, which is our um, and, and nomenclature here, but it means you keep your daven the way it says in Japan, the calendar, but for Shabbos and for Yontiv, you also keep the second day, Shabbos and Yontiv on the next day, which means on Sunday. Hawaii, which is possibly the most relevant for residents of Los Angeles, is the same thing except in reverse, which means really the day is like with Tukashinsky, which means Friday is Shabbos. And I know there's some post in Los Angeles say the other way. I'm aware of that, but this is my shear, yeah? And I'm just telling you what the consensus of, the, um, of these post game was. You go ahead and you keep Friday as Shabbos. That's the main day. And that's what you daven. You daven feel the Shabbos on Friday, Kriya Santara on, on Friday. And, but you also don't do Malach de Raisa on Saturday. Okay, that's not like most people do. It's really worthwhile getting out of Hawaii before Thursday night, before you have problems, which is what you should be making Kiddush and lighting Shabbos candles. Um, Labavish Psak there is not like that. If Labavish Psak was like that, they might as well close up shop and go someplace else because no one's going to listen to them. But but nevertheless, nevertheless, um, it, it's an issue. Australia is no issue at all. That everyone accepts that their Saturday is Shabbos and um, Sunday is after Shabbos. Some people have an issue about swimming offshore if they're worried about the Chazanish. That's beyond what we're discussing tonight. But it is basically agreed, as has been agreed for the last 170 years, that Australia, what they call Saturday is Saturday, is Shabbos, what they call Sunday is the day after Shabbos. However they got there, but that's what they hold. And then, then New Zealand is, again, this Monday and Tuesday. Now, by the way, something interesting here, which applies to both New Zealand and to Japan, Rebbe Yashi was asked, there's a rabbi, someone named a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, Rabbi Eli Putney, who lives in um, Phoenix or um, Scottsdale, one of those places. He was offered a position in Auckland, New Zealand, and he didn't want to keep two-day Shabbos because he wasn't going to take the position. So he went, Rev Morgenstern, who's a big post in Yerushalayim, went to Rebbe Yashiv and asked him, what should this year do about Shabbos in New Zealand and be living in New Zealand? And he told him he doesn't have to worry about the Chazanish at all. He should just keep the local day. Now, this is the same Rebel Yashiv who says he should be Machmir for both days on Shabbos in Japan. What does that mean, the way I explain it? If you live someplace, you're entitled to take on the local custom. That's Allah by Minhagi, as you learned way back in Psachim, which was a long time ago. Um, but uh, And um, if you live someplace, you take on the Minhagi. If you're visiting, you have to keep the Minhagi where you come from. The, the, the consensus is basically to be worried about the opinion of the Chazanish and keep the second day derisive. But if you're living someplace, you can ignore that concern. So that's why you live someplace, you just have to keep the Tuesday, meaning Rav Tukashinsky's day. If you're not there, you have to keep both days. I'm going to flip through here some other things I have, Indian Ocean, Madagascar. We don't have time to discuss that now. But let's just look at what we see here as we finish this year. And as I run to Shachris. Basically, the Poskim, not Rav Chaim Kanievsky, Shlita, but the Poskim have adopted the line of Rav Chaim despite the fact that it has no source, and despite the fact that the Baal Amor and the Kuzari, as we saw, basically refute his opinion. How can it be, even if you have questions on the Chazanish, if you'll mostly show them don't hold like that, how do you run from there and get to here? It's like running from the frying pan to the fire. Why are you adopting this? This is only Sfarah. This was refuted. And the answer, I think, is, is that as long as the Balamor and the Kuzari have the deciding vote, and this is the halacha, then Rav Tukashinsky's is out the window. Sfarah doesn't hold water against what the Rishonim say, what's the Psak halacha. But the minute you have enough questions on this, which it seems the Postkim did, to, to 
give up this opinion. You don't hold this opinion anymore. So now you have nothing. And it can't be the Rebbe Shalom left Shabbos for 25% of the world, for 90 years of the world, in limbo. It has to be there's a resolution. What's the resolution? It makes sense to say the Rebbe gave it to the Chacham, like he did Malachas and Cholomoed, like he did what are the Lamates Malachas, but he did many things. Sometimes it's left to the Chachamim to decide what yes and what not. Of course, usually it's talking about the Chachamim, the Tanoim, the Amoraim, the Chachme Gemara, the Gaonim. But in this case, where the issue only came up in later days, it's the Chachamim we have, El Ashofet, Asher Yia Bayom And once you have nothing on the table, then Sfara becomes paramount. Chazanish never said that you took a Shizki Sfara wasn't a good Sfara. He just said that it's refuted by the Balamor and the Kuzri. But if they're off the table, for whatever reason they're off the table, so then you're left with the Sfara, and then this becomes Allah. That's how I understand the Peah, the very interesting Peah, from the Rishon and the Gemara to the Halacha. And um, that's the end of our shir for this evening. Um, by the way, this is a beautiful three-volume set. It is available. I'm not there to auto give autograph copies. It's available on Amazon <clears throat> and in your local bookstore. Thank you for joining. I have to run to um, to Shachris now. Um, as you can see, it's light outside over here. What I, maybe you can't see it, but it is. At any rate, I'd like to thank you all for joining. It's a pleasure to visit Los Angeles, even from a distance. And um, if you do have any questions, my uh, email address is jerusalemkosher at gmail.com, jerusalemkosher at gmail.com. I'd be very happy to discuss anything with you. Thank you for joining, and I'm going to run. Okay, bye-bye. Stay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I am going to write him, Ernie, because, uh, in fact, I know Rabbi Heinemann um, has a different opinion that the Mashkichim for the uh, uh, the Star K follow in terms of Hawaii, because he quotes, uh, there are a number of other poskim who, who take that curved line that uh, Rabbi Kuber went through very quickly, and they say that it, it's, if you, it's a, this is Rabbi Heinemann says that it's a majority, you take, you take the Chazanish and you take the the other postkin who, who take that curve line, and that includes Rabbi Rabinowitz Tumim, the, the Atse Sode, the Alene uh, Aleona, and thus it's two against one, and they follow the majority. So I'm glad right. that he the numbers. So I'm going to all, all write him and ask him about that because I know that that's what they follow. Yeah, yeah, that is the Star K's opinion. All right. Yeah. Yaakov, I will send you his email. If you, if you okay. didn't catch it, I'll forward the email to you. I mean, okay. he was really yeah. good. I thought he was excellent. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's brilliant. Yeah. But you could see why it's so hard to to, to follow, um, and I'm also not sure. I guess I'll ask him this too. I, I, he assumes that the Gemara, um, in the Gemara, the two opinions, Reb Zera and the other opinion, are complementary. They're not the, that you have to have both. I know that there are some who believe that it's they're, they're, they uh, it's t it's a true machlokis. So you don't need both, which of course changes the whole equation. Whether you need the 24 hours. Uh, before Shkodesh and the Molad before noon. So, all right, I'll ask him that too. Right. right. Ernie Yeshikach for putting this together. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Rav Salgunen, for it's, it's great to see such a such a, a wide crowd uh, uh, enjoying Rabbi Kuber. Shkodesh, Shkodesh. Ernie. Nice right. to see you, everybody. Yeah, cool. Have a good day, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Be well. Hi, Barry. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs>